Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 179, Gaming on the Cheap, No Cost and Low Cost Games. I'm Sean, and here with me tonight, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and working with you to make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So today we've got another question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons who's looking for some no-cost to low-cost games. After that, we've got a review of a game we got on the cheap that turned out to be well worth it, The Downfall of Pompeii. We wrap up with a week in review featuring Psy that four players, our first landing game of Preta Porte, and Sean is getting addicted to Hades. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a snarky comment on our where to start with D&D 5e topic from two weeks back. Daft Fully writes, start by playing the grown-up version of D&D, AD&D, from 1978. Like this old guy who has played D&D for almost 43 years. I, honestly, to each their own, but come on, calling it the grown-up version of D&D is not a good look. Who's the grown-up here? The hobby doesn't need this kind of gatekeeping BS. Play the edition you want, sure, but don't judge others for what they play. Uh, next. Ne oh. <clears throat> Next up, a comment about our last AMA, where Sean was talking about his favorite superhero RPGs. Dian Li Zhang writes, best superhero game is Golden Heroes. I will die on that hill. That one that you played? Uh, so Golden Heroes was actually a photocopied amateur publication uh, in 1982 that did go on to be released by Games Workshop in 1984. Oh, wow. Games Workshop. And then later went on to be revisited by one of the original authors and re and published uh, in, in part as well as modernized as Squadron UK. Okay. Now, while through the 90s even, this was a huge favorite and recommended over Marvel superheroes for campaign play. Not one-offs, okay. but for long-term play. Now, while I do know of it, I have not had my hands on a copy. So I... I sort of hesitate to say much more, but uh, it was very favorably reviewed for a very long time. So you got a new Grail game you're going to have to seek out <laughs> just to, to find out if it's good as everyone says? Uh, who knows? Uh, you'll have to, well, I'll pull, I'll have to pull one of your uh, old uh, White GW Dwarfs. Mag White Dwarfs off. Uh, I believe it's either, <laughs> either number 60 or 64 that has the review. Of oh, it. <laughs> I don't think I go back that far. Oh, okay. I started with White Dwarf 100. Oh, I did wow. pick up a couple issues here and there that are older, but no, I didn't actually start collecting until issue 100. Right. So uh, sticking with supers, a reply on our talk about the new Marvel Multiverse RPG from Joe Fryer, who says, I perused some of the content. I think my biggest issue is the powers are a bit lackluster. Mm. Some are more of usual everyday actions you could do, not really a power per se. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, they will expand on them a bit more, but the character creation is rather easy. Given my history with champions, D&D, &D, and Rollmaster, it's a bit of a relief that you can create a character rather quickly, not accounting for origin stories and such. I gotta say, that's a jump from champions, D&D, &D, and Rollmaster to that. that. There's a leap into modern gaming right there. Uh, thanks for the comment, Joe. Um, I guess we pretty much said the same thing, right? We said the whole power system was a little bit odd. And especially the non-powered things listed as powers with the, um, what were they called? Utility powers? Utility powers, yeah. Yeah, where like, so like Spider-Man Snark was a power. That was a little <laughs> odd. And the fact that you can create characters at all was a big move for Marvel on this one. Yes. And I think a very welcome one to see. Next, I've got a comment from Alan on our Charms and Potions unboxing video that Sean can answer better than I can since I haven't actually used my box. So Alan writes, thanks for this nicely made video. Are the cards in your expansion a lighter color than the one in the original base game? Mine looks so different. So sadly, I have two expansions and the base game, and I can absolutely 100% sort them back into their individual uh, boxes by card backs alone. Oof. If this were a competitive game, I would be furious. 
But as a co-op game I play with my kids, it doesn't really bother me. No one's, you know, cheating or, or stacking the deck. True. The official sleeves have backs on the sleeves. So sure. I expect that they just expect people who care to sleeve their cards anyway, or they're just trying to push people into buying the sleeves. Yeah, whenever we play, we play with open hands anyway. So yeah, I don't exactly. even see how it, it probably shouldn't matter. As a, as a family, you know, as a family co-op, it's not really a big deal. It I, I can absolutely see how hardcore gamers just see that and cringe, though. Oh, yeah. I understand. Well, next up, Chris Groff is back, this time talking about tea games. Great list. I'd also add Ingenious Travel Edition. If you like the Duke and or Onitama, then I'd also throw War Chest onto the list. It adds okay. the draw bag concept from the Duke, uh, adds a bit of bluffing element, and is asymmetrical. Now, Hanamikoji is a nice, tight little card game about winning the favor of a geisha. Realms, or, or Star Realms, etc., you know, fill in the blank realms. My preferred flavor mm. is Hero Realms, but I won't pass up Star Realms. There is also Cthulhu Realms, but it falls short from the other two in a mm. few ways, though I do like the art. Well, thanks, as always, for the comment, Chris. Uh, some great suggestions here. Now, as for War Chest, I, I found that one to be a bit of a step up from both the Duke and Onitama, both in level of complexity and game time, especially when playing with four players. Now, you'd only be playing two-player for our T-Games uh, list, and I, I can see it working. So to me, it might it, it's borderline T-Game to me. It seems like a step above. Now, Hamana Koji, that is actually a solid game, that I've only had the pleasure of playing online. I don't even remember which online site had it, but I definitely tried it out. And I'm like, this is pretty good. And I admit, if I owned the physical game, I probably would have made the list. As for the Realms games, my only concern here is space. You can end up, besides like just the market you're buying from with six, seven cards, and then the auto cards you can always buy, you can end up with a pretty big tableau in that game, especially if you play defensively. Like in Star Realms, building a lot of bases can make, take up a lot of room. Other than that, though, if you have the room, these are great tea games. Well, let's finish off this week's feedback with some comments on our Herb Witches Quacks of Quedlinburg review, starting with Cindy Robertson, who says, I agree with you on everything that this expansion adds. It's such a great expansion. Deanna might really like the Alchemist expansion. In that one, you're actually trying to treat a patient. Now, Phil Hatfield writes, interesting. I definitely fall into the it was just okay camp for quacks. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if I get a chance to play with herb witches, it will alter my perception of it. I didn't have a huge problem with the game, but it just didn't enthuse me all that much. It did feel rather random. Thanks for the review of this. Well, thanks, Cindy and Phil. Um, I do really want to try out Alchemist. Uh, honestly, if they had had that at the CG Realm when we went in for free RPG day, we probably would have picked it up. For now, though, it's sitting on our wish list. And Phil, I do encourage you to give a game a go with Herb Witches because it worked for Dee. Like she definitely found she didn't have enough player agency, whereas Herb Witches gave her just enough to move the game from meh to pretty good. Well, we did get one more comment on our Herb Witches review, but it wasn't actually about that review, so I separated it out. Yeah. Anthony Hargis commented to say, I have to ask, with time being limited and considering all the games you review, have you ever played the same game twice? Uh, most definitely. Um, actually, what people may or may not be aware of is that we actually try to play every game we review at least five times with at least two different groups. I honestly don't think you can get a real feel of a game by only playing it a couple of times, and even less so if you only play it once. Like, there are just far too many games over the years that I have played that either I didn't enjoy on the first play, that I grew to love, uh, for example, right now, Scythe is one of those games. My first two plays did not go well, um, and I basically wrote it off. And it's only because of you, our fans, that I'm actually giving it another shot now. And now I'm playing with a different group of gamers, and I'm finding a lot to like. And then the other side, of course, are games I loved on the first play that ended up liking less and less the more I played it. Yes, every now and then, there's a game that's so simple that it only takes a couple of plays to grok, and I gotta say most party games kind of fall into this category, but in general, we honestly tried to play every game that hits our hands at least five times before we review it. Note, that's a formal review. 
We'll talk about it after the first, second, third plays, but that's in our Bellhops tabletop segment, which is part of why we separate out those two segments. Because the one's kind of like, what have we been playing? What do we think of what we're playing? Whereas once we get to the formal review, you should know that we have definitely uh, kind of put the game through its paces before we said anything. And Note 5 is the minimum. There are some games we played 20 times before we get the review up. Even I try to get at least a couple of plays digitally or in person whenever possible, so I'm not just smiling and nodding along with the reviews. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Now, one heads up before we get to the main topic tonight. Okay, next week, Amazon Prime Day hits. I'm going to say day, but it's days because there's more than one of them. And as an Amazon affiliate, we're going to be super busy. Now, note this is next week now, so it's actually the 12th and 13th of July, so depending on when you're listening to this. And now, due to Prime Day hitting, we're going to be swamped, so we will not be recording an episode next Wednesday, nor releasing a podcast on the following Tuesday. Well, we won't be here to, uh, we do encourage you to watch TabletopBellhop.com for some great deals on Tabletop mm -hmm. Games, as well as following at Tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. Now, to that end, actually, earlier today, Deanna finished it up and we launched our Amazon Prime Day landing page. So basically, it's like kind of a pre-sale page that includes some great early Prime Day deals. And that's going to be the main place that we'll be updating in the events as, as the event unfolds next week. Actually, there's some pre-sale deals right now where you can save like $72.50 in credit you can earn before Prime Day hits. While they're not gaming deals, you could get that credit to spend on games. Now, assuming this year is no exception, it's not just going to be Amazon deals that'll be hitting. Plus, there's also Game Nerds Nerds Day, which is another big online game store. And this one's all games. That hits on Friday. And I know every Prime Day, lots of other publishers and online sites try to jump in and ride the Prime Day wave. So don't just expect Amazon sales. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's topic comes from a suggestion from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Math Guy Dave, who thought it would be cool if we spent an episode talking about low-cost, no-cost games. Yeah, I thought this was a great suggestion from Dave that I keep meaning to get to. It's in our pile of topics, and it's actually kind of near the top. And I see it, and I think about it, and I see it, and I think about it. And I figure with Prime Day hitting on the 12th and 13th, and Nerds Day hitting on the 15th, and all the copycat sales at other online and physical stores going on all week seem like a good time to suggest some great low cost and no cost games. And we're not too far away from the usual annual Gen Con sales as well. Yes. Now, note, this is not going to be a conversation on how to get the best deals on board games or a look at our insider tips for finding board game deals. All I'll say here is if you're looking for the best deals on tabletop games, a little self-promotion here, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on tabletop gaming deals, follow tabletop underscore deals on Twitter, or join the Good Geek Deals Facebook group. Links to all these tabletop deals, resources in the show notes below. So what we are actually going to do tonight is highlight, suggest, I guess, some of the best no-cost and low-cost games we could find with me highlighting some great U.S. deals. And me highlighting some deals I found in Canada. They do exist. Note, our source for these games and prices is Amazon, either .com or in my case, .ca. And these yep. prices were accurate as of July 6th, 2022. So let's start with some mass market games that we actually like that you can get for under 10 bucks at Amazon.com. Starting with Boggle Classic, which you can currently get for $9.97. This is the classic word building building game with the, the dice cubes you shake up in the plastic thing and everyone writes down as many words as they can. And if you match words, you cross them off and you get points for what's left. This is actually one of my wife's favorite games of all time. She loves playing it with her mom. Uh, it's something she plays with my kids as well. Now, this particular version comes in a great small travel pack. It makes it great for tossing in the glove box, a purse or a backpack. And that was Boggle Classic. Next, I have Monopoly Deal coming in at 966, and honestly, that's high right now. It's often been lower. I don't know how many times we said it, but I'm going to say it again. This is an actually good version of Monopoly, where you're trying to collect three complete property sets. Seriously, this one is even nominated for some board game awards and worth checking out. Don't bypass it because of the Monopoly name. 
Now that was Monopoly Deal, and it's available even cheaper in Canada at only five dollars. Nice, five dollars Canadian. I should just buy that at five dollars Canadian. I keep walking by it at Chopper's Drug Mart, and it's thirteen there, and I'm like, thirteen is just a bit above my buy it right off. Next, I block is Travel for nine ninety nine. This is a smaller, more portable board than the original game, but capes all the rest of the gameplay elements of Blockus, which is a mass market game that I absolutely adore around here. This is a game where you have a bunch of Tetris-shaped polyominoes. You're trying to place all of your pieces on the grid before your opponent does, with the restriction being that you can only touch your own pieces diagonally, never orthogonally. And that was Blockus Travel. Rory's Story Cubes are next again at $9.99. Now, the best part about these symbol-laden dice are the number of different games you can play with them, many including improv RPG-style games where players are trying to spend the dice in their hands or tell stories based on the dice in the table and so on. Honestly, this is a game where you're going to probably want more than one set. The one set's about 10 bucks. The more sets you have, the more variety you're going to get. But honestly, I had just the basic set for years and loved it and only eventually added the Batman set to that recently. And that was Rory's Story Cubes. Next, I have Quick Set 790. I like to call this one the hipster roll and write because it was doing roll and writes before they were cool. Roll and writes have pretty much exploded recently. Uh, this is one of those games that everyone is forced to use the same results on the dice. I love those style of games where you like you roll the dice and everyone's forced to deal with what they have in their own way. But in the end, of course, every player's scorecard is going to turn out completely different. Um, this one has seven award nominations and three wins. This is guaranteed to be a great roll and write that just uses standard D6 dice. Easy enough to get grandma to play. And that was Quicks. And this one is also available in Canada within our slightly higher limits on the Canadian prices. Next, I have Farkle 999. Uh, this is the dice game for people who kind of like it but are sick of Yahtzee. Uh, to me, it's just got that bit more strategy to it. And I also really like the push your luck element. Like in Yahtzee, you get to roll three times. Well, Farkle, you can just keep rolling, but you could bust. So you want to sit there and push it as close as you can to make as many sets as you can. If you do like Yahtzee at all, give Farkle a try. If you decide you're sick of Yahtzee, this is a refreshing take on a very similar style game. And that was Farkle. Next, I have uh, my last U.S. mass market game would be Wizard. Uh, currently, I'm finding decks for $8.99. This one is for our trick-taking game fans. This is Spades on Steroids. You get your standard deck of cards, but you add in four Wizards, which are the highest in each suit, and four Jokers, which are the lowest in each suit. Now, this is a bidding game, just like Spades, where you're going to predict how many tricks you're going to take and get points for taking those amount of tricks. What makes this one fun is that you, it kind of like the Mind now, though obviously the Mind came way later. Your first hand is one card. Whoever takes that first strike, your second hand is two tricks. Your third hand is three tricks with three cards and so on, all the way up to 13 cards in your hand. If you like trick taking, seriously, try out Wizard. Like even if you're like hardcore game, I don't play traditional card games. Seriously, Wizard is a fantastic take that's just a little different from your traditional card game. And that was Wizard. Now, so as to not leave our Canadian followers out, here are some great mass market games for under 15. Now, note, we upped the price to 15 to account for higher game costs and the exchange rate. Unfortunately, you're not going to find very many games in Canada for under 10. So first up, we got Spot It Anniversary Edition coming in at $13.99. Okay. This is a family weight pattern matching game that has a ton of variations. It's very mass market, but with the ton of themes available for folks who enjoy it, there's can be a lot there. And this one's up there with Rory Story Cubes for having different ways to play. There's play your cards, there's match your cards, even cooperative versions of Spot It. And that is specifically the Spot It Anniversary Edition. Next up, we have Milborn Express. This is coming in at $13.27. This is a dice and card version of the classic card-based racing game, Milborn. Now, I haven't played this one specifically, but I have always had a mm -hmm. soft spot for anything, Milborn. Yeah, I love the original card game. I also haven't tried this one, but I would be totally worth checking out my opinion. And that was Milborn Express. Now, next up, we have the Game of Life, the Marvelous Miss Maisel edition. Okay. So at 1413, this is a modern update on the classic Game of Life. 
and it follows the life of the main character from the aforementioned TV show. It's not going to win any awards, but it could be a fun alternative for those who are big fans of the TV show. Yeah, from my side of thing, I don't even know who Marvelous Miss Maisel is, but I did used to love the game of life. That was the game of life, the Marvelous Miss Maisel, Mrs. Sorry, Mrs. Maisel edition. So uh, next up, we Skip Bo for eleven dollars and sixty six cents. Mm-hmm. Skip Bo has been around since the sixties, and its staying power is because it is just a classic go to card game for all ages. My kids have loved this one from very early on and they still pick it up from time to time and it's just it, you know it just lasts and that was the classic card game skip bow next up rummy cup travel for 10.99 now how often can you get a 1980 spiel de genre <laughs> winner for such a low price well here's your chance this one is another classic that really belongs in the collection of most families i'd say Style based game of just making runs of numbers as it, as you do in Rummy. Yeah, it's it's very much Rummy Mahjong that style of game. I've heard it pronounced a million different ways: Rummy Cube, Rubby Cub, Rubby Cup. But that was Rummy Cup Travel. So next up, we have Apples to Apples at twelve ninety seven. This, of course, is a classic party game, and our recommendation for those of you who think they want to buy Cards Against Humanity and are absolutely <laughs> wrong. It was even a 1999 Mensa Select winner. Yeah, this is a a match up your cards and find the best match, which often when playing with adults, especially if adult beverages are involved, goes blue without it being thrown in your face and being forced upon you. And that was apples to apples. Okay, well, now enough with the mass market stuff. How about some hobby games? Again, we're going to start with games for under $10 at Amazon.com. No thanks. Not as in no thanks. I don't want games at less than 10 bucks. No thanks you can currently get for $9.99. Honestly, everyone should own a copy. No thanks. This is a simple to learn, but engaging gameplay makes us the perfect filler, icebreaker, or end of game night aperitif. On your turn, take the card dealt to you or put it on a chip on it and pass. At the end, score the total of all your cards and the lowest score wins. But there's a trick. Any straights, you only score the lowest card in the run. Honestly, this is a fantastic game. I basically just taught you how to play. Um, You can watch actual plays of this. Uh, No thanks, just a great game. It is one of the better, simple, easy to learn gateway hobby games. And that was No Thanks. Uh, This one surprised me. You can currently get the crew, the quest for Planet 9 for $9.99. That is a lot of games and gameplay for under 10 bucks. This is a cooperative trick-taking game that follows a campaign where you work through 50 progressively harder missions. Now, gameplay is pretty typical trick-taking, but lots of special goals each game, like take a set number of tricks or win a trick with specific cards, avoid certain cards or get tricks in a certain order, and so on. That was The Crew Quest for Planet Nine. A lot of game for $9.99. Yes. Next, I have Sushi Go at $6.29. This pick and pass card game, probably the simplest drafting game out there, features easy to learn set collection rules with pretty simple scoring. Now, I admit, both Sean and I both recommend Sushi Go Party over the base game. You can't beat the under $7 price point of the original. Absolutely. And that is Sushi Go. All right, one I never thought I'd be able to put on this list. The biggest, heaviest, most complicated game on our list tonight, Disney Sidekicks. 788. This is an odd one. I gotta admit, we didn't review this game all that favorably. But if you want a super hard to win, extremely difficult cooperative game to challenge your experienced game group, this game might be for you. For the rest of you, eight bucks is a really good price for some really cool Disney miniatures. And you might get lucky and actually enjoy the game. And that was Disney Sidekicks. Then I have. The Magic the Gathering 2021 Arena Starter Kit, which currently you can get for only $6.99. So this does come with two physical Magic the Gathering decks that are ready to play, as well as the rules for how to play Magic, and you can play lots of games against each other and you're good. But this also comes with deck boxes to hold them, so that's usually an additional cost, and cards with QR codes that will unlock these two specific decks 
for you to play Magic the Gathering Arena, which is a free-to-play online version of Magic. Sorry, I shouldn't say it's a freemium online version of Magic where you can buy cards. Now, the problem with this one is, and I was a little hesitant to put it on the list, is this might get you into Magic, and that is not cheap or free or low-cost in any way. And that was the Magic the Gathering 2021 Arena Starter Kit. Next, I have Pooh, eight ninety nine. If you are looking for a beer and pretzel silly themed take that game that'll get some laughs, this is a solid choice. This is literally a game about monkeys throwing poo at each other, where it's kind of an RPG like where the poo does damage and everyone has 20 health and you want to be the last monkey standing. This is one of the few super light, fun, silly games that I actually kept because I don't mind breaking this one out at three in the morning on New Year's or an early morning extra life night. And that was Pooh, one of the very few fecal-themed games that we will ever recommend. Very true. Next, I have one that the chat room already called out tonight, and that is Silver and Gold. This is a flip and write for only nine fifty. Now, technically, this should be an honorable mention because I've never played it, but Silver and Gold is a very well-regarded flip and write game that almost every podcaster I listen to loves. This pirate-themed game has a handful of award wins and nominations, and it's one that's actually on my personal wish list. That was Silver and Gold. And next, we're back over the border with some cheap hobby games from Amazon Canada. First up, Saboteur for eleven sixty six. This is a hidden role path builder that I actually enjoy playing, unlike most in the uh, hidden role uh, uh, genre. What's interesting is Saboteur Duel, the two-player version you can get in the U.S. for under 10, but not the base game. Interesting. And Saboteur Duel, I'm like, I don't know. I, I haven't played that one. I have played Saboteur. My friend Jamie loves it. I can see the appeal. You know my thoughts on hidden role games. Mm -hmm. That was the original Saboteur. Next up, we have Don't Llama Card Game, 1386. Now, this is a 2019 Renier Nitzia card game of trying to empty your hand first and not get caught with any negative points or a llama. Mm -hmm. The lowest score wins when the first person gets to 40. This I have heard fantastic things about. I have heard a lot of people do that. I think in the States it's just called llama instead of don't llama, or maybe there's another Nitzia game called llama and I might be confusing them. For some reason, a whole bunch of llama games come. We're sick of Mars now. We're on to llamas. I don't know what's up with that, but that was Don't Llama from Herr Nitzia. And there is a dice version of this one as well uh, that's come okay. out since, since Don't Llama. Um, <laughs> so next up we have Kabam! And that's Kabam with three M's. For okay. thirteen fifteen. this is a 2020 pattern matching dexterity game with a superhero theme. Really lightweight, color matching, who can do it first game, but fun with a theme that we all know works for me. Don loves his super games. That was Kabam! Our next up, Super Cats for $14.99. <laughs> Just slipping nice. in there. We've reviewed this one right here on the channel. It's an advanced rock, paper, scissors with Sentai themed cats. It's such a weird game. You're competing with this rock, paper, scissors thing, and then you, the winner gets to battle the robo dog. Uh, it's such a strange game, but dirt cheap and lots of fun. That was Super Cats. All right. And next. Lost City Rivals for $14.90. <laughs> Honestly, I hate this game. But there are people out there who love it. And the pickings are very slim for low-cost games in Canada. Sure. It's a multiplayer auction version of Lost Cities that I personally feel loses most, if not all, the fun of the original. But take what you can get. I can't remember. Did we actually review this one? This might have been a game where I just chose not to publish my review because I was yeah, that we've unimpressed talked, with we've it. We've talked about it. We have it. talked we about it. it. Yeah. Honestly, like it, in my opinion, get Lost Cities. <laughs> but if you want to play Lost Cities with four people or you love it, that is Lost Cities Rivals. You can get it cheap enough. So far, our list has been all board games and we don't want to leave our RPG fans in the dust. So here are some cheap RPGs you can get right now in america yes first up is fate accelerated which actually should be under 15 in canada as well uh this is a version of fate that has an msrp of five dollars 
you can honestly get it for $3.99 because it's on sale right now, which I think is a little silly. Uh, this is a very solid generic system based on Fate Core that I know a lot of people actually prefer to Fate Core. Actually, our friend Tracy, most recent RPG was based on the Fate L Accelerated Base System. Now, it features only four action types that you can do, but still uses fudge dice and all the aspects and other things you expect from Fate. Now, I'll admit, you're probably going to want to set a fudge dice for this one as well. Those standard D6s can be substituted, but you can't beat a full modern role-playing game system for five bucks. So in Canada, it will just sneak in at fourteen seventy four. Okay, that still seems high. Like, if you can get it at your local game store, I think it was supposed to be $5 Canadian as well. That, right, was, that, was, fate. that was Fate Accelerated. Yes. Next, I have Basic Fantasy, and I'm really tempted because we're live on video to pick this up and show it to you. The paperback of this role-playing game is only $5.50. This is a super rules-light, pretty much OSR Fantasy T20 game. Now, not only is the base game cheap, but so are the various splat books. Now, I picked this one up myself as I couldn't turn down a full, complete role-playing game system for under five, well, sorry, when I get for, for 550. And this is like a thick physical book. It's very well produced. It's well bound. There's artwork. You're not getting like this slapped together zine. This is a full fantasy role-playing game. I was shocked by how much you get and even more shocked when I picked up source books for like $2 each. And they were just as content filled. You can kind of see it there under Pompeii, just how thick that $5 book is. Uh, in Canada, you can pick that one up for $7.25, although the guides are a little pricier at $5 each. So uh, your your overall costs will, will be uh, a little on the higher. But that was Basic Fantasy. Finally, I have the Savage Worlds Deluxe Explorers Edition, the Lost Leader. Uh, for Savage Worlds in the previous edition. This is not the current edition of Savage Worlds, but it's only $9.99. And honestly, it is a fantastic game that many, many groups have enjoyed for years. This is the edition I played and fell in love with. You got playing card-driven initiative, miniature-based combat if you want it, and as they like to advertise, fast, furious fun. Added to that, because Savage Worlds, this was the main edition for many years, there are a ton of free adventures, often called one sheets, and content out there, as this was the dominant edition. In Canada, however, nowhere near under $15. See, I picked up my copy for $12 at the local game store at the day. So I think it's just the fact it's out of print. Absolutely. So uh, there's very little on Amazon Canada, except for Dice or the odd campaign book that's going to come in under $15. But how about free games? I think we know something about those. All right. I'm, I'm going to totally cop out a bit here. I'm going to start by pointing people to some of our previous content, starting with the Tabletop Hop Gaming Podcast, episode 90, Free D6, and the article that goes with it, Free D6 Games, where we highlight 25 games that only require you to have some standard six-sided dice. These aren't even print and plays. These are the kind of things where you can just read the rules online. Some do have things you can print. And then I also want to point you to a list we have on the blog, which we'll link below, that features over 300 free print-and-play games and expansions. Now, so as not to disappoint you all here live and listening right now, here are some of our favorite free board games and RPGs. So for me, the first one I have to call out, just because we just talked about it two weeks ago, was in our Getting Started with Dungeons & Dragons episode, where we talked about the, which starter set you could buy. There we pointed out you can get the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Core Rules completely and totally free right now from Wizards of the Coast at dnd.wizards.com. The Core Rules from going level 1 to 20, including monsters and magic items, are all completely free. Now, for uh, sci-fi, an old-school inspired, you can get Stars Without Number, the free revised edition, which does leave out a couple of aspects of the game, but has more than enough to get a lot of game you play in before you're missing any of it. Also, if you prefer fantasy to sci-fi, Worlds Without Number has got your back with the revised edition of that, also free. That's both of the Without Number games. Next, I've got another free fantasy role-playing game, Dungeon Crawl Classics. The quick start rules and starter adventure used to be five bucks, 
They're now offering the digital version completely free at the Goodman Games website. I actually really enjoy Dungeon Crawl Classics. To me, it's 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 my preferred flavor of OSR, and this is a great place to start. Now, I will admit, it's not going to get you all the way to level 20 like the D&D rules. Now, for something non-fantasy, you can get the City of Mist starter set for free. This is one I think Sean backed on Kickstarter. Is that the one you, yeah, you were waiting for? So you can actually get the starter set for City of Mist once the... um. Kickstarter finished, they released the rules for free. This is a comic book film noir role-playing games. So for super fans, you can also check out on Drive Through RPG Kapow! <laughs> with 170 pages of superhero wow. fun. Now, this is a PDF. It's not great graphics or professional layout, but <laughs> there is plenty of content and guidance to get your original superheroes to the table. Even badly laid out, a seven, 170 pages is a lot of content. That is. Now, there are a ton of other free RPG quick starts out there, including stuff released just a couple of weeks ago for free RPG Day. We also encourage people to check out the free section of Drive Through RPG and itch.io. All right, let's move on to some non-role-playing games, and I want to start with a big, cool mini or not game that you can get completely free, and that is Xenoshift Onslaught. This is an alien predator inspired deck building game from Simon that was originally huge Kickstarter at the time before they started doing the huge miniature ones. I actually have friends that own copies of this game. We all blinged out early in the lockdown. Simon decided to offer the entire game for free as a print and play. And honestly, I really dig this deck building game. It had plenty of tension, tension and most importantly, really good mechanics for cooperating that made you feel like a squad. I strongly recommend checking out Xenoshift Onslaught and work together with your friends to fight back the Xeno threat. And that was the Xenoshift Onslaught print and play. Next, I have a game we talk about all the time on this show and bemoan the fact it's out of print and we usually don't mention it, but you can actually get it 100% free. That is Yardmaster, a Thinky filler train game that we absolutely love. Now, sadly, the publisher of this game, Crash Games, has gone under, and the game's, far as I know, dead in the water because of that. But one of the awesome things they did was toss up the print and play version for free on Board Game Geek. And that was Yardmaster. Now, my last free game suggestion I'm going to throw tonight is the free print and play version of Unfair from Good Games Publishing. All of us love this theme park building card game, and the fact you can print your own copy is just awesome. Well, you're still going to need some tokens for tracking cash and a first player token and round trackers and stuff like that. You can still have all of the fun of Unfair without the cost of buying a $60 game. And that was Unfair. So now there are also other ways to play free board games that don't require a printer, but do require some internet access, which I assume you all have because you're listening to us right now. Uh, that is, of course, playing online through sites like Board Game Arena and virtual tabletops like Tabletop Simulator. Now, along with this, there are also dedicated sites for specific games. I'd strongly recommend checking out the Codenames version you can play online as well as, of course, full digital versions of games that cost way less than their physical counterparts. The Steam version of Terraforming Mars costs you way less than the Stronghold version. While we don't have time to get into all the options here, I do encourage you to check out these digital options. They'll be warned. Just yesterday, I was reading someone who started playing Board Game Arena for free, and in less than a day, ended up with a two-year subscription and had ordered the Japanese import version of Can't Stop because it was so much prettier than the American version. <laughs> there you go. Doesn't always end up being cheap. Yeah, it's just like the Magic the Gathering caveat. You start with that starter set. I, I don't want responsibility for starting to dig that hole for you. Now, finally, I am going to offer up my all-time best tip for making this hobby as cheap as possible, and that is to get involved with the local or online gaming community. Online, there are Facebook groups, Discord servers, and other great places to get together and play games. Forums and Board Game Geek, you can find people all over the place. And in person, check out your local game stores, gaming cafes, meetups, possibly libraries, and other places gamers gather. Honestly, the cheapest way to take part in this hobby, after all, is to play someone else's game. Well, that's it for our talk about low-cost, 
and no-cost tabletop games. Now remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions every week. Well, most weeks. We're going to miss next week. But we're usually here for you. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Hello, and welcome to our review of The Downfall of Pompeii, a classic Euro game. How does it stand up 18 years after its initial release? The Downfall of Pompeii was designed by Klaus Jürgen Word, who is best known as the designer of the very well-known tiling game Carcassonne. Features artwork from Oliver Fredenreich and Guido Hoffman. Was originally produced by Amigo in Germany in 2004, and then two years later released in North America in English from Mayfair Games. Now, while Mayfair Games is no more, and this game is technically out of print, you can still find it at various online and physical stores. For example, we got our copy dirt cheap at Princess Auto here in Windsor. There was also a second English edition printed in 2013, which is what we have. Mm -hmm. The most obvious physical difference in the editions being the first edition box is landscape, uh, while the second editions are portrait orientation. Now, the 2013 edition also includes three dual vent promo tiles, which were originally a con exclusive. Now, the Dawnfall of Dawnfall? <laughs> the Dawnfall. Dawn, that sounds like a sci-fi game. We got to write an RPG called Dawnfall. Anyway, Downfall of Pompeii is listed as a two to four player game on the box on Board Game Geek and everywhere else, but I would say it's a three or four player game. Games are quick, with most being done in under an hour, and they get quicker the more experienced the players are. Board Game Geek overwhelmingly recommends four player, in fact, as the best play at number. Yeah, I can't disagree with that. Now, in The Downfall of Pompeii, you play out the tragic history of the ancient Roman city of Pompeii, which rested at the foot of Mount Vesuvius. You start by moving people into the city, and then those people start inviting more family members to join as their relatives. Then disaster strikes, and the game totally swaps to being about how many people you can lead to freedom before Vesuvius destroys the city for good. Despite the somewhat dark theme, this is a family weight game mm -hmm. we've enjoyed but with both adults and kids alike. Now, as a historical note, Pompeii had it really mm. rough. 17 years before Vesuvius erupted, burying the town, an earthquake destroyed much of the city. And during the excavation, the city was found to still be undergoing reconstruction from the <laughs> earthquake when it was buried by the uh, volcano. Now, for a look at the surprisingly nice components for the time this game was published at, check out our The Downfall, Downfall of Pompeii unboxing video on YouTube. Your fault. <laughs> <Don> Your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, the component quality in this game is pretty impressive, uh, especially the plastic volcano that's honestly easily assembled and taken apart between plays. It's not just flat. Like, there's little molded divots and stuff in it. Now, of course, the best way to play this game and make it even cooler is to toss an LED tea light into that volcano. And honestly, don't you dare share a picture of you playing the game without a tea light online unless you want commenters coming out of the woodwork to tell you to use one. And please do use LED tea lights. Yes. Flammable tea lights are not your friend here. Plastic volcano. That's an important note. I guess it's better than paper volcano, but still. Definitely not fireproof volcano. Maybe you can get a Teflon coating and coat your volcano to add that realism. But then you're going to be tossing wood bits in there, and that's bad. Now, besides the cool volcano, you also get lava tiles, a bag to put them in, single-sided mounted board, deck of cards, a clear set of instructions, and cylindrical playing pieces in four colors. Now, these playing pieces are the cause of my biggest complaint about this game. While you get nice wooden pieces in four colors, and they're hexagonal so they don't roll away, which is great, you don't get the same number of pieces in each color. Well, now that we know what you get, how about you walk us through how to play The Downfall of Pompeii? This one's easy enough. I'm pretty much going to give you an almost full teach, except for one thing at the beginning that's just a little bit too much. 
So you start by building the volcano and you put the board out, you grab a set of player pieces in your chosen color if it's available. Uh, you set up the deck with starting cards according to the instructions. So here's the cop out because setting up the deck in this game is the most fiddly part of the game. And I never remember it. And every time I sit down to play, I got to grab the rules to figure out how to do the seven decks of four cards and everything else. So I'm not going to get into it here, but if you do want those full details, again, check the instructions of the game or check out the written version of this review at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. We are not an AP or rules video. We're here to give you an idea of if you want to buy this game or play it or not. Yes, just know the most fiddly part is setting up the initial deck. It's still not hard. It just, again, I got to reference the rules every time. Now, the game is played over three main phases. Now, the rules only separate the game into two, but I find there are three distinct phases of play when you play this game and that's how i like to teach the game and that's how i'm going to talk about it tonight now the first phase is called bring new citizens or sorry new citizens move to pompeii you play a card from your hand and put a person on the building that matches the card nice and simple draw a replacement card keep doing that going around the table until someone draws the first 79 ad card with a nice picture of vesuvius on it now, why anyone would move to a city that was still rebuilding after a major earthquake is beyond me, but so be it. Well, the land was almost magically fertile. Stuff grew huge there for some reason that I'm sure the Romans didn't quite understand at the time. That we now know that volcanic ash is actually really rich in nutrients. Next is my second phase. This is one that's not in the book that I call invite your relatives to join you. You've moved your people into Pompeii, and now they start bringing their relatives to the town. So after the first 79 AD card is drawn, you now place additional pieces on your turn if you place your first play piece in a building that already contains one or more of your people. For every person that's already there, you're going to get a bonus relative that you can now move in into the same colored building or a neutral gray building. Come on over, folks. Sure, the last few years were rough, but how could it get any worse? Am I right? Now, in addition to placing relatives, once you get to this phase of the game, you may be drawing omen cards. When this happens, they choose one playing piece of any color on the board and toss it into the volcano, then draw a replacement card. This continues until the second 79 AD card comes up. Note that I am not aware of any sacrificing to the volcano that was going on that this might represent. Now, I'm pretty sure thematically this is supposed to just be people going missing, which is why they call them omen cards. The actual cutthroat nature of this mechanic, though, is not a thematic element, just a mechanic. Now, the final phase of the downfall of Pompeii, my, my version of the rules, is run for your lives. At this point, everyone discards their hands and all cards can be placed back in the box. You then begin filling the board with lava, each player drawing a lava tile from the bag and placing it until there are six on the board. Now, any pieces covered by lava or completely cut off from any exits are tossed in the volcano. Tossing people in the volcano is, in fact, one of the highlights yeah. of this fun game. Now, after the initial six lava tiles are placed, each player on their turn will draw in place one more lava tile and then move their people. Now, they're going to get to move twice, either one piece two times or two different pieces once. Now, when moving people, you're going to get to move them a number of squares equal to the total number of playing pieces on that square before being moved. So a single piece on its own can only move one space, but one that's in a pile of five pieces would be able to move five squares. Now, the goal here is to get as many of your pieces out the city gates where they're considered safe. You collect any of the ones you save and put them in front of you. Historical note, they weren't actually safe there. Now, play continues until there's no pieces left in the city or the bag runs out of lava tiles, whichever comes first. If you do run out of every tile, uh, uh, sorry, if you do run out of tiles, everyone in the city is tossed in the volcano. Player with the most escape people in front of them wins the game. In the case of the tie, the win goes to the player with the least people in the volcano. Sadly, this quite enjoyable game does not represent the facts of what actually happened to the poor people of Pompeii but instead posits a rather fanciful tale of escape and safety for many. Like Sounds the simple. Disney version of Pompeii. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds simple enough. Now that we know how to play, what did you think of the downfall of Pompeii? So this is a game with simple, easy to differentiate components that's very easy to learn and quick to play. This is a game that kids can enjoy, but has more than enough depth to challenge experienced players. 
The theme, though dark, is interesting, historically based, and surprisingly well tied to the mechanics, which I admit wasn't very common for games that old. It really is impressive to see this level of theme integration for an early aughts game. Now, while I could totally see a kickstarted deluxe version of the downfall of Pompeii with unique miniatures for every player and a deluxe plastic volcano that lights up and does a Wilhelm scream every time you toss a mini in it, there's just something about the existing design that just, well dated, feels kind of elegant. I'm also not sure the Wilhelm scream would pass a cultural consultant's approval. Uh, fair enough. Maybe they'll scream in Roman. Of course, when talking components, I can't help but mention, again, the fact the game didn't give you an equal number of all the colored playing pieces, which means that at different player counts, you are forced to use different colors. I'm kind of baffled by this, though I do know of at least one other game that did this, which also happens to be from Mayfair. So I guess it was just something they did. This was their way to keep the costs a bit lower, I guess. All I can say is I'm really glad this isn't a trend that continued into modern board games. The fact that in order to have a proper two-player game, you have to play with specific colors is infuri infuriating, to be sure. Now, I do have one other complaint with the game that I kind of alluded to earlier, and that it's specifically when playing with two players. Besides not getting to play my favorite color, yellow, we also found that the game just wasn't that good with only two people. With only two, it becomes far too easy to end up with a tie at the end of the game, especially if blows both players managed to get all their pieces out during the first two phases, which isn't hard to do because there's less competition. While I would say the game is playable at two and it works, there are plenty of other games in my collection that play great at two, and I can't personally see ever breaking out Pompeii for a two-player game again. And once again, it's four that's actually the recommended best count, even though three is playable. Now, the gameplay and downfall of Pompeii is tense and engaging start to finish. One of the best aspects of this game is trying to plan ahead because you know what's coming. When placing your pieces during the first two phases, you're well aware of what's next and what you're going to have to do. And figuring out the best way to use your cards to both get the most people out uh, during the first two phases, as well as trying to position them so they're near gates, is what keeps us coming back to this game time and time again. Of course, there is the random lava factor, so planning only gets you so far. Yeah, and this variability in the cards, as well as the lava tiles, does mean that while the gameplay never changes, every game of Pompeii plays the same, every time you sit down to play, you're going to get a different experience. The random factor in this game makes the game much more replayable. It's never quite the same game twice. Though in no way does the city survive. No. R.I.P. Pompeii. Overall, Downfall of Pompeii is a classic Euro game that totally stands the test of time. Despite being 18 years old, this is a very solid gateway game that's easy to learn and fun to play with gamers of all experience levels. If you dig classic Euro games, you probably already own the Downfall of Pompeii, but if you don't, it's worth picking up as soon as you can. Now, especially because it's currently available at bargain rates, both online and in physical stores. Remember, this game is out of print, with Mayfair going under, so these cheap copies are gone. You may never see the game again, just like the city. There are still deals to be had on the secondary market as well for this currently. Mm -hmm. But again, once stock in stores dries up, so will the deals in the secondary market. I honestly think most game groups are going to dig this game. There's really is a lot to like. I've yet to introduce this game to someone out there and not have them enjoy it. And many of the people I have shown the game to have requested that I break it out again and again, my kids included. It's always nice to see classic games like this really stand the test of time and prove that one and done doesn't have to be the way of games. Now, if you're a gamer who's all about table presence, lots of plastic bits and detailed miniatures and building scenery, this may not be the game for you. Though I personally think the gameplay is solid enough. If this is something you're into, you could always pick it up and then pimp it out. Build a deluxe volcano and find some ancient Roman citizen miniatures to use for your villagers. Well, that's it for our review of The Downfall of Pompeii, a classic Euro game that actually stood the test of time, unlike the city it's based on. <laughs> What's a classic game you still think is great? Tell us about it in the comments down below.
Now, before we go, I do want to invite you to check out the written review of The Downfall of Pompeii over at tabletopbellhop.com. There, I go into more detail about how to play and share some more of my thoughts on the game, as well as pictures from our plays. And now, The Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. So this past week, I got two physical game plays in. Um, and I want to start off the four player game of Scythe. Yes, we are giving Scythe or I am giving Scythe a second chance. Uh, Sean's going to get to try it on Friday. So we'll get to see Sean's opinion on Scythe because that's definitely on my list to play. This was my first. Well, I don't know if it was my first. I can't remember who may, who how many people I played the first time I played. I think it was five. This is my first four player game with my copy of Scythe retrying it. I don't even know how many years later. I don't know when I played it the first time. It was probably 2016 when the game came out. So whatever, four to six years later. So it was um, myself, Deanna, who played the game before, my mother-in-law, Brenda, and my oldest daughter, Gwen. First game for Brenda and Gwen, third game for Deanna, and officially the sixth game for me? No, five, fifth? I think fifth game for me. I was surprised. I was a little concerned that Brenda and Gwen, it might be overwhelming. And I will say it is. Scythe is overwhelming. It's There is way more than you're going to be able to figure out in this game in one play. Uh, similar though to Terra Mystica, which is another game where I've explained this before. Terra Mystica, you have 11 different actions to choose from, but each one of those is really simple. Like uh, what you do in each of those 11 things is really simple, but it's figuring out how those interact. That's the real meat of the game. Well, side, there's seven different actions. I think it was seven. Maybe not. I don't know. No, it's not seven. I'm thinking of uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak had seven actions because we just reviewed that. So you have four different options, tops, and then four different bottoms. So I don't know if you consider that eight different actions. I guess eight different actions. So not as complex as Terra Mystica, but again, the whole sweetness of the game is how those interact. And I was glad to see they picked up how to play pretty easily. Now, again, I've now played the game enough times I can explain it way better than I did that first night when there were other things that also impeded our ability to learn the game. Um, one of the things that both Brenda and Gwen, Gwen in particular, was fascinated by was how asymmetric Psy is. So not only do you get a unique player board that's asymmetric with your own abilities, and your own starting resources, you then get a random other board. And then that random other board has things paired up different. So there's these top actions and bottom actions. Well, what two actions are paired up and top and bottom are different on these boards. And then not only that, the actual, not the cost, but what you get, yes, the cost and what you get for the bottom actions are different, which I didn't even notice the first couple of plays. So like you might get a board where mechs only cost you two steel and give you three bucks when you build them. Whereas someone else might have to pay four steel and they don't get any money when they build mechs. So obviously one board's better at building mechs than another. So that was an aspect of the game even we didn't see. So again, I'm five plays in and I'm still noticing things about this game. And to me, that is the... Biggest thing with side. I wanted to say feature, but I'm not saying it's feature because in today's one and done board game world, lots of people are going to play it the first time like I did, just be overwhelmed and hate it because that's what happened to me. And anyone who knows the game is going to dominate anyone who doesn't. Well, and that's what I mean. I played the digital version once. Uh, the onboarding experience was not great. And I, as a result, the game experience wasn't great. And I uninstalled yep. it. I haven't played it again since. Which I may have to play buy it just so we can play it together. But then again, you're going to be down. So I think our best bet is to actually just play the physical version. Yep. Um, so overall, it went well. I surprisingly well. Um, as we just said, Deanna and I dominated because we played before. Um, know what I didn't like in this one, but this is again just learn to play better, I guess. Is Deanna? I could end the game. I was sitting with four stars and could easily earn two stars at any time and call the game over. But I could tell looking at Deanna, she had more points. So I didn't want to end it, and I was dragging it out, but I wasn't able to catch up. And I found that a little annoying, but I think that was just more two things. One, I should have just ended it. Like, ah, I can't win. Give it to D. Let's play another game. Let's go play another round. Or two, I just wasn't seeing the way to get those points up. Right. And I will admit, when I finally did go, okay, you know what? I'm going to end it. She's going to win. I'm going to end it. She would have ended it next turn, so it wouldn't have mattered either way. So that was, but again, I think that's just to learn to play the game better thing not a fault of the game Fair. so yeah enjoying scythe way more than i originally did um we'll see what the final result is i, I need to play it with five which hopefully we'll get to do on friday 
Um, I probably will try the solo just because it's there. So we'll try that out. But I think this one's going to be a little while before we review it. Like, I, I don't think five plays is going to be enough for me to have a final thought on side. Fair. So uh, I've been working tons. But one of my uh, co-workers that I sort of share duties with is on vacation, meaning that I'm doing all the duties. Uh, <laughs> so we're once uh, once this week is over, that's done, though. And then the rest of my time, I bought Hades uh, because of the Steam sale. Uh, and uh, that's yeah, there's it's um, one more game. Oh, wait, it's 2 a.m. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, I oh. sat down the other day. Uh, I don't remember what day of the week this was. And I'm like, I'm going to take a break and go do a run of Hades. Four and a half hours later, D came down and was like, are you going to bed? <laughs> so it happens. Uh, Sean's been playing on hard mode. He's he's he refuses to use God mode, which I turned on as soon as it was an option because I am all about getting the story. And I know this won a Nebula Award, so I want to know the story, and I just want to see the things. Uh, but because he's been playing it without, I decided to try it without. So my last four runs have been without. And I'll admit, I haven't been able to beat 80s yet. I routinely get past the um, Hydra. But after that, yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah, Hades is good. You know what? I just re- You're playing it with keyboard? Yeah. I wonder if that's enough to just make a difference. Because to me, that is very much a controller game. Yeah, I what, can't imagine one of the things. One keyboard. of the things I noticed that I don't do is um, I, I almost never use the call. Um, I like the call of God thing. Even if even if I have unlocked a a, a God's oh yeah, call, I almost never do it because it's just here. I'll, I'll give you. It's not a spoiler, but um, oh, I don't know how it works on Steam, but I unlocked a hidden achievement today that I thought was kind of smart. So have you battled a God yet? Like when when you get a choice and the gods get mad at you? Yeah, yeah. So if you're battling a god, summon their own call at full strength. Well, I don't think I've had the option to do that, but I'll have to try that. Okay. Yeah, that that I, I pulled that, that one off sense. today, and it that gave me a one of the like the super rare hidden achievements, right? Because like, and it was something like that was a bad choice. I think it was called. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, I, I pulled that one off today. That was something new I unlocked. I, I admit the, the the game is amazing in the 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 iterations, the 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 amount, like not just the story. The story's awesome. The music's awesome. I now have um. I can't remember his name. The, Zag. the huh? Zag. No, no, no. Oh, no. The uh, the bard, the, uh, the I musician. Yet. Well, I now have him singing. So not only have I unlocked him, I've I've hooked him up with his muse again and all this stuff. I'm currently working on a whole story arc with uh, Achilles and Patroclus, and like the fact there is a whole story arc with <laughs> Achilles. Yeah, the and writing Patroclus. on it is fantastic. It really is. Yeah. Um, and just like the, they're still uh, just today, Nix told me she was impressed by the flowers I built. So like using the gems to add stuff that's that says right. it's just decorations is also driving dialogue. So, right. yeah, 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 super impressed. Yeah. And, and I have to say, one of the things that the game does really well is the narrator prompts appear all over the place and they aren't always easy to see. So yeah. you can, you know, there's times when it's like you, you've you been there a dozen times and all of a sudden you notice that little white dot sort of flashing off in the corner where there's some extra narrator stuff you didn't even know about. I'll admit, I haven't seen a new narrator thing in a long time. So I don't know if I've actually hit them all Possibly. or or if I'm just missing them. I, I've still never beaten the Hydra yet. So that's my next goal is to beat the Hydra. To the Hydra, I get past regularly. I don't and the Hydra hasn't been a problem. Um, The ones after that, the which I won't spoil then. I won't spoil the next one. I haven't, I, they they give me difficulty, and go. and well, Hades is ridiculous wow. in a way. All right, all right. Physical games. Deanna and I sat down. I don't know what day of the week is. My week's all messed up because like we took a we took Tuesday off, like it was planned. Like the kids weren't here, and we 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 played games Monday night. We had some beers. Like we watched some really bad movies that we were talking about at the beginning of the show. Um. Whatever day it was, we sat down and tried to learn Pret a Porte. And man, it was rough. Now, I know Portal Games has a reputation. And every time I mention this, someone comes out of the woodwork to point out this reputation for terrible rule books. And this is the third printing of the game. And I've got to say, the rule book's perfectly fine. There is nothing wrong with that rule book at all. It clearly explains how to play the game and the actions you take and how they work. The problem is it's a card-driven game. Um, I would probably compare it to Unfair, 
where, you know, the basic rules of how to draft cards and what your actions are are pretty basic, but then it's all about how the cards interact and your mashing of the decks. Well, that's what this is. So you are hiring, um, you're, you're getting contracts, hiring employees and building buildings. And the way those interact is it makes the game kind of ridiculous. That's where the weight comes from is making all these things interact and everything has upkeep costs and get you money and whatever. And we spent probably an hour Googling stuff and arguing over what card should do what and what the timing was. And does this let me do this or not? And I don't know what changed between board game geek and Google, but it used to be if you put in X board game and put a question in quotes, you would get a direct link to board game geek and a forum thread. It's like the forums on board game geek aren't indexing as well anymore or something, which is probably a Google thing. So anytime I did that, all I would get is predator the the main page. So then we're on board game geek and we're in the rules forum, trying to scroll through, looking at the titles of all the different threads, trying to find these specific real questions. And I dug up a couple threads and I noticed in two or three different threads, people keep linking to something called the almanac. So eventually I'm like, all right, what the heck's this almanac? Well, the almanac is the page, well, two, three pages that should have been in the damn box. Like I'll use the word damn here because if we we're explicit, I'd use a stronger word. There is no reason this was not included in the box. It is published by Portal Games and it clearly explains what every card does as well as clarifying the timing and some other rules. I, I, how was this not in here? Again, Portal's famous for it. Like they, they had a game that crashed and burned because the instruction book was so bad. Um, the Martian follow-up to Robinson Crusoe. And from what I understand, the first printing of the Robinson Crusoe rule book was also terrible. Personally, I haven't had a problem with this. I have Imperial Settlers by them. I love it. I have uh, Stronghold, the two-player game, Siege game, and it was fine. But they're known for bad rule books. Well, I finally got to experience it myself. Though, again, the rule book that's in there is perfectly clear. It's trying to figure out the timing and the rule. It's just missing a rule book. <laughs> yeah, it's basically missing the reference. I think you're getting tapestry, but they don't give you the sheet that tells you all the action spots do. Right. That's somewhere else online. And you got to figure it out by looking at the icons because that's what this was. It's like, here's an icon. What's that icon mean? And there's a little icon reference. So besides that, we figure out how to play. We start playing and I, I made a mistake. I don't even know but it was the most lopsided board game I've ever played. I spent, so you play 12 rounds. I would say I spent, well, you don't have any points until like the fourth round. Let me think. Yeah, fourth round is the first time you actually score points. But the, the fashion phase of the fourth round, so not even the fourth month. So it would have been the ninth month? Yeah, the ninth month you finally get, no, it can't be, that's too far. Ow, oh, whatever. Um, so many months in, you get your first fashion show and you get your first points. I spent that until the end of the game with 18 points. Meanwhile, Deanna, every income phase was scoring 25. By the time we got to the last fashion show, she had lapped the board so much that there was no token to represent how many points she had because there was already a plus 100 that was used up. She was in the 200s and I was still in the 100s. Our final score was like 147 to 400. It was just ridiculous. And I'll admit it wasn't fun. Like, and, and in, didn't feel like there was anything I can do. There's no like get other people's buildings demolished or get people fired. She had the stuff she built and it worked well together. Meanwhile, I was broke most of the time, which honestly in an economic game, that's what I expect. Any game that gives me both line of credit rules and loan rules, I expect to be trying to balance the budget. Here she was just piling up money every turn, just money, 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 money. It all had to do with the fact that in the first two actions of the game, she got two accountants. Those two accountants provided her, well, at first with five bucks every round, then she upgraded those accountants to give her seven bucks every round, which didn't actually cost her anything because the two extra bucks are the same as her income. And that just let her always have money. And because she had money, she could build more buildings and she could hire more people and she could buy all the threads she wanted. And she didn't have to waste actions on going on spots to get more money because she had the money to go other places. I just got utterly destroyed. Yeah, And like I said, not fun, like literally not fun. Yeah, that's rough. And I mean, I know there is the whole idea of if you can lose it in the first round, it's a great, you know, economic game. Um, but if you, I, I don't know, if, if you can't win after the first round, what's the point in playing the rest of the rounds? I, I mean, yeah, 
I don't know. So, I, 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 I don't said know. that the, the, the heavy cardboard line is always if you can't lose the first round of the game, you shouldn't have that round in the game. And that is a design goal of people like Phil Eklund and other heavy game designers. Um, I am not a fan of the game Container. Container is a game where there is a, a closed market. And if the players start devaluing goods less than their costs, you can have what is called the Whirlpool of Death, where all the goods undervalue and all players lose. To me, that's a bad game design. Yeah, I A mean, lot of people love Container, though. Now, this wasn't at Container level. <laughs> this was at the first time you play Power Grid, you spend all your money. And you didn't realize it, so now you can't build more plants and you can't afford the goods to power your plants and you're literally out of the game for the rest of the game. No Power Grid Deluxe, fix this game. If that ever happens, you get bonus money to, to remove the ability to lose in the first round. This was more on the food chain magnet, where if you didn't build like a pizza fridge or a burger joint or something to start generating food the first turn, you're out. This was more like that. And I honestly feel I played badly in the way that I didn't do something to make me money or I didn't prevent her from getting it. Because one of those two turns, I would have been first player and could have grabbed my own account. Right. Maybe in that game, if an account comes up, the first two rounds, you get it. That's a thing, part of the game. What I will say on a positive note, I'm willing to give it another try. Um, this isn't obligation, so I don't have to give it another try. I could just throw this on my shelf with the other games, maybe try it with Neil, because it's his kind of game, or leave it for something Deanna brings out to game nights to play with other economic gamers. I'm totally going to give it another try, and I will admit that I spent, I don't know, the next 24 hours after playing, I would say, thinking about it, about what I would do different, how how did it break. I literally spent three hours watching how to play videos and FAQs to see if we screwed anything up. And of course, Bellhop's Law, we did. It was our first play, so it was extreme. But it ends up we played extreme that Deanna would have done better. Uh, we were playing you could upgrade, you could you could promote a person or upgrade a building. It's actually you can promote a person and or upgrade a building. So she would have been even better off if we use the actual rules. Right. Now, it's also possible this game's terrible to players, but Board Game Geek didn't seem to do that. Actually, it's listed as preferred at wait, the best at four, but better at two than three. So I don't know. I want to try a four player. I think that'll make a difference. And well, if Deanna and I play again, I'm, I'm going to be more aware of what can happen. So maybe I can either take advantage of it or prevent it. There we go. All right. Well, uh, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So there's a lot going on over the next couple of weeks, um, especially Prime Day and Nerds Day hitting next week. Uh, Tori and Kat are still out of town. So we don't have any gaming planned for this Friday. But then the Friday after, Sean's going to be in town, and we've got lots of games to catch up on. Size the big one. I don't know if I'll submit Sean to Preda Porter or not. <laughs> probably not. That's not really his kind of game. But there's other stuff we'll probably play. Size the big one. I want him to play Scythe. We'll probably also try what's in the box over there, which we'll unpack in a bit. So that's next. I have a package right here. We're going to open that in the after show. Um, that's something I'm looking forward to playing with my family. This is something that I got to play with the kids mainly. Um, but I will have to record an unboxing video, which will hopefully happen this weekend before things get too crazy. Um, as for that, I, I can't really say exactly what I'll play, but it's going to be two weeks. We'll be busy, but then we'll be relaxing. Sean will be down. I think we'll have plenty to talk about when we come back. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. The Misdirected Mark Podcast. Still going strong, talking games and game mastery. Ducas, thank you. Evil John, thanks, Mr. Carney. Donna, thank you, Pax. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and it's time to lock those front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop One Word, and on your podcatcher of choice under Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. You can show your support for the show and all of the content we produce at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop, which can get you some honest bonus content as well. That wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and I invite you to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.